Father God, we thank you so much that you are here, and we thank you so much for the privilege we have to worship you, to be able to enter your courts with praise and to worship you. You're so amazing. And Lord, we place ourselves before you this morning. We want to hear your, your word. We want to see your word penetrate our hearts. We thank you that your word doesn't come with condemnation, but your word is there to encourage us to open our eyes up to who you are and what you want to do in our lives. So we place ourselves available. We say yes to your word. Uh, we open our hearts up to what you want to say and what you want to communicate to us. We say yes in advance to what you're going to say. So Holy Spirit, may you come and bring uh, the word uh, in our lives in, in a new way. Let it, be, let it become flesh in us. And we want to leave here with something, Father. So we place ourselves before you and be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you may be seated. Can you tell someone or your neighbor that the gate is open and the light is green? Can you do that? The gate is open and the light is green. So we'll be talking about the open gate, and that the light is green this morning. And if you have your Bible, turn with me to Mark chapter 10, verse 46. It's an amazing story that we find in the gospel. And uh, it's a story that, is, uh, that I always love speaking on. I remember it being a teenager and hearing this message from the pulpit the first time. It really triggered something in my heart, and I'd like to express that this morning. So if you look at Mark chapter 10, verse 46, it talks about Bartimaeus as Jesus was um, going to Jerusalem, passing by Jericho as he was ascending to Jerusalem, and he met this uh, beggar, this blind man. And if we read the story in verse 46, it says... Then they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him. But yet, but he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man, cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. And Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, I like this, jumped up and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go for your faith has healed you. Instantly the man could see and he followed Jesus down the road. Beautiful story, right? I love the story about Bart Bartimaeus. And if you look at the, at the name Bartimaeus, it has two words in his name. The first word is bar, that means son, and Bartimaeus means unclean. So his name was son of the unclean. It's not a good, good name to have, right? You don't want to call your son Bartimaeus. Uh, so, so you look at Bartimaeus, he had a few challenges going his, his way. First, we know he was blind. And we also see that he had family issues, or there's a family tree here. There's something that happened in his past that his family was tagged when it comes to uncleanness. We don't know exactly what it is. Uh, but you see this guy that is a beggar, and he's on the road. And uh, I've been to uh, Jericho last week, and it's, uh, in, in the biblical times, it was a nice city. But the moment you come out of that village or that place, it's very dry. And it's, it's, it's close to the Jordan, but at the same time, it's away from Jerusalem. It's about 15 miles from Jerusalem. So this guy is trying to get people uh, on the way to Jerusalem. Uh, people are going for Easter to Jerusalem, and he's trying to get some money from people passing by. And then you see Jesus pass by. What a story, though, eh? This guy is, pass, uh, Jesus passing by, and he's blind, and he's a beggar. And then he, he, he comes to know that Jesus is passing by, right, because he can't see, and he shouts, Son of David, have mercy on me. He cries out to the Lord, right? Have mercy on me, Jesus, Son of David. And then what happened is that there's some people around him that, t that tells him to be quiet and just to hush, hush, and, and he yells even louder, right? Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stops in his track and he says, hey, Get him to come to me. And, and you see Bartimaeus throwing his coat, jumping on his feet, and going to see Jesus, right? And, and, and the story is, is that he got healed and he followed Jesus. A beautiful story. 
And I remember being a teenager and hearing this for the first time. I, I, I remember being with my parents. I was about 14 years old, and uh, we were not really following the Lord. We accepted the Lord in our lives, but we weren't really following the Lord. And we went to this country church, and they had this special speaker, this guest speaker that was preaching, and he was preaching about Bartimaeus. And I remember being there. It really hit home, and I, I was really... Uh, I, I was kind of uh, amazed by this man that was a beggar, blind, and dared yelling out, Son of David, have mercy on me. And it really triggered something in my heart. And I, I, in the way that I, I looked at this and I said, God, I, if I would be in Bartimaeus' shoes, I would want to respond like he did. He wasn't afraid of what people were thinking. He, he, he had a need and he was afraid to respond to Jesus. And, and I think it's... Uh, it's important for us to realize that God wants us to respond to him. I, I believe that the light is green. I believe that the gate is open. But I think there's a need for us to respond to the call of God. Uh, I look at Bartimaeus when he was on this road, when Jesus was passing by. He could have missed Jesus, right? Because Jesus was going to Jerusalem. He was not stopping at Jericho just because Jericho was his, his destination. Jericho was not his destination. His destination was Jerusalem. So on the way, this, this man stopped Jesus in his tracks, and he said, hey, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. He could have stayed in his corner. He could have um, hid behind his blanket. He could have had a self-pity party, uh, but he decided to yell and get, and, and he decided to have Jesus' attention by yelling out, Son of David, have mercy on me. So when I look at that story, what I really learned then, and I, what I'm learning still today, and I want to convey to you, is that I need to respond to Jesus. I need to respond to what I see. I need to respond to the gospel. I need to respond to God's word. If I don't respond, I might miss out on what God has in store. Amen? So when you look at our journey as believers, when we look at what God has done to make it possible for us to know him, like I said, God laid a foundation for me to be able to enter in what he has in store for me. Like I said, uh, the light is green and the gate is open. If you look at Isaiah 61 verse 1, just to lay the foundation that makes us able to connect with God or, or makes us, um, gives us the possibility or the privilege to, uh, to enter in what God has in store. You look at chapter 61 verse 1, it's really the mission statement of Jesus. It resumes Jesus. Isaiah is considered the fifth gospel because it focuses a lot on Jesus. And there's a prophetic word regarding the Messiah. And later on in the gospel, Jesus confirms that it's him. But let's take a look at verse 1. It says, the spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. So to bring hope, Jesus came to bring hope. And then it says, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. He came to heal hearts, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and to release from darkness for the prisoners. He came to bring us liberty so that we can run the race, to take off what, what prevents us of going forward. It says in verse 2, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It's to proclaim grace, that we can walk and live under grace. And also, the day of vengeance of our God, meaning that God will bring justice, so we can trust that God will bring justice. And then it says, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, to make you a son and a daughter. That's what really it means. The oil of gladness instead of mourning and a garment of praise instead of the spirit of despair. This is what Jesus came to do. Jesus paved the way, made a way for us to experience freedom. So that's the foundation. That's the foundation that we need to understand, that when Jesus came, he came to bring us freedom. And we can go to Isaiah 61 and say, God, I want to see that in my life. I want to see this grow in my life. I want to grow in freedom. I want to grow in your healing. I want to find my identity in you, and so on. There's so much to draw from that text. But when I, when I say that this text opens the gate or turns the light green, uh, I, I think we, we, we have to realize that that brings me to a place where I need to respond. Um, 
I have, I have a dog, and sometimes I use him as an example. Uh, he's 15-ish, going on 16. He's kind of blind, and I said that before, and deaf a bit. One of the things I like to do just to trick him is I like to pretend to tie him uh, when he goes outside. I pretend to tie him, and then he thinks he's tied up. And then he goes outside, and he stops right at the end of the garage. But he doesn't know he's free. <laughs> but, but he thinks he's tied up. And you could go on the end of the road and call him, and there's a good chance he wouldn't see you because he's blind. Uh, but let's say he would see, he wouldn't come and see you because in his head, he's tied up. So what's the point, right? What's the point of fighting with the chain? I'm tied up, right? So, so I, I look at our lives sometimes. Uh, we think that we're tied up. We think that the light is, is red, but it's green. And sometimes we miss out on what God has in store because we think that the gate is closed, but it's open. Have you ever been behind someone on the road, like you, you're in town or you go to the city in Winnipeg, and then the, learn turn, the light turns green, and the people in front of you are not moving, right? And then you dare see the guy or the lady before you with his head down, and you know that while the light is red, he's texting, right? So what, what I want to do, uh, when that happens, there's something that arises in me. I, I just want to do this, you know? And sometimes I'll do a little Christian one. <laughs> but sometimes I want to do a two-hander, right? Like, come on, get out of the way. And then what I want to do, if it's a two-lane, I want to go beside them and give them the face. <laughs> come on, right? Come on. The light is green. Move it, you know? The gate is open. Walk in it. And I think it's the same thing when it comes to our faith. God, I think heaven is all around us. And in God's sovereignty, he tries to get us to respond to that open gate or to that green light. Sometimes what happens is we park in the green light. Like I know that that's annoying if that would happen in real, in real life where this, you got this guy in front of you that, that parks on the red light. Or let's say you go see the Jets lose against Montreal Canadian. I, 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 I had to say that, right? Uh, boo, I know. I'm a, I'm a Jets fan for the, for, for the West and, you know, what can you do? I was raised in a French home, so the Habs is part of my traditions. And um, so let's, go, let's say you go to see a game. And then uh, you're waiting in line, right? You're all excited. You arrive earlier. You're, you went to park your car. and you're, you're in the arena. and You're waiting for the gate to open. And you got some people that are there standing and not going in. Like, you're going to do this, right? You got to be careful because your kids are with you. Because if your kids would be with you, you would do it. Right? I can use it all in this service because it's going to be good. So the, the thing is, if you come back to Bortemius, Jesus was passing by. The, the, the gate was open. The light was green. Hey, he's passing by. Let's do something about it. Let's respond, right? Let's respond to the call. And one of the problems I believe that we have, uh, one of the uh, lack of knowledge or unbelief that we have or false doctrine is that we look at the Bible in a general way and we don't personalize it. One of the things that I need to realize is that I'm deeply loved, right? I'm, I know that God, when he looks at me, uh, when he looks in, at me in the crowd, he knows exactly who I am. I, I look at my testimony, my journey, and you have a testimony, and you have a journey, and we all have a story to tell. That's the, how God is so amazing, right? He reveals himself to us in a personal way, and, and out of his sovereignty, he leads me to a point where I do uh, surrender, I accept him as my, my Lord and Savior. It's an amazing journey, it's awesome to see. At the same time, when I look at my life, I have to realize that when it comes to personalizing the gospel, I need to know that God loves me, but at the same time, I, I gotta realize that sometimes God looks at me, and he says, Claude, are you gonna respond? Are you going to respond? Sometimes I see the Bible in a general way, and I don't see it in a personal way. And, and so that's what I'd like to unpack uh, this, uh, uh, this morning, that I'm called to cooperate with God, that when Jesus walked near Jericho, 
It was ordained, it was planned, he was walking by, but there was this man, Bartimius, that said, hey, I'm not gonna be quiet. I'm not gonna sit there and die. I'm gonna call, son of David, have mercy on me. I'm gonna throw my coat aside. I'm gonna jump up. I'll get someone to carry me to Jesus, bring me to Jesus. I, I wanna be healed, I wanna be restored. I want to follow him on the road to Jerusalem. Awesome, right? And, and I think we got something to learn when it comes to this. So you see Bart responded uh, to the invitation. Bart responded to the green light that was before him. And I believe it's important for us to respond. There's three, place, three places that I need to respond. I know there would be more. I just want to major in three places that we're called to respond. You can follow me in, in, your, in the notes of the bulletin. The first one is I need to step out. It's time for me to leave my past behind, walk away from my sins, surrender my hurts to the Lord. I, I, I need to realize that God did all pave the way for me to experience that freedom, that I can experience freedom because he has come to bring me freedom. I can experience forgiveness. It says in 1 John chapter 1, if I confess my sin, he's faithful and just to forgive my sins. I can experience healing and restoration because we read in Isaiah 61 that he came to heal the brokenhearted. So God lays the foundation, but I need to respond. God doesn't want you to put, it, put your life on park when the light is green and being caught by your past. God doesn't want you to be a slave of your past. God doesn't want you to be a prisoner of your sins. God doesn't want you to be caught with the things that, uh, uh, that prevents you of going forward. He wants you to experience freedom. He made a way for you to experience freedom. He paved the way, but at the same time, I need to respond, I need to choose, I need to take a step forward, I need to make a stand, and I have to say, God, I want to move from there. Amen? I think that's huge, because I might miss on what Jesus uh, has for me. Uh, Jesus might be passing by, but if I don't see my need, and I'm not, and if, if I don't see um, also the need to move on, I might miss out on God. And I know that life is rough. And I know when it comes to the past, there's a lot of things that happen in relationship, in business, in life, family matters. You know, sometimes it's hard, but I need to come to a point, listen, I need to come to a point where I have to move on. Because God has provided the means for me to move on. I've got to tap in what God has given me so I can move on. I, I don't want to miss out on what he has in store. It might be a big thing. It might be a small thing. It might be something that you experienced last week or last month. But what you want to do, what you don't want to see, I mean, it's to be a prisoner of your events. And that's what we talked about uh, in the last weeks, right? When it comes to a setback, to a comeback, I don't want to make my setback my destination. But I need to know that God has made a way for me to experience freedom, but really, when it all, it's all said and done, it's my choice. It's my choice. I have the freedom to respond. God gave me freedom, and I have a, choose to, I have a choice to enter through the gate or, or to, uh, to, to walk or drive on the, on the green light or park on the side and miss out on what God has for us. And we don't want to see that. We don't want to miss out on what God has in store. I like what it says in Isaiah 43, verse 18. It says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it, it springs up. Do you not perceive it? Do you not see it? I'm making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. And pre previously to that, he talks about how God led the people out of Egypt. And what he's saying here is that I was faithful in the past and I will be faithful again. I was faithful when I led the people out of Egypt. I will be faithful to you again, but you need to embark. You need to take a step forward. You need to enter through the gate. You need to walk on that green light. If I stay back, Listen, this is so huge. If I stay back, I will miss on what God has in store for me. So I'm called to step out of my past. My, my prayer this morning is that you would make a decision and you would, make a, you would take a stand say, to, to say, you know what? I'm tired of dragging this. I'm, tr I'm tired of dragging this sin. I'm, try I'm, I'm tired of replaying that tape. Uh, the, my generation, right? My, this tape over and over again. I, I, I want to see a breakthrough. That we would have a desire. 
like Bartimaeus to have a breakthrough where we say, son of David, have mercy on me. And even though there might be pressure and circumstances are not for you, you go beyond that. And you say, son of David, Jesus, have mercy on me. You know what's going to happen when you enter that gate and you walk on that green light? You will experience freedom. God will lead you on this journey because that's what he wants. According to Isaiah 61, that's what he has for you to experience his joy, his freedom, his grace, and for you to be a cedar in Lebanon, to be able to bloom in him. So that's what he has in store for you. So I've got to enter in what he has in store to step out. Secondly, it's time for me to step in my calling. There's a green light. It says, and, I, and we've used this verse a lot in GMC, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10, that God has prepared good works in advance for you to practice, right? So God has set the path. He has plans for you. It also says in the Hebrew chapter 12, verse 1, that he has set a path for you, so uh, get, uh, get free from the sin that so easily entangles us and run the race that is before you. So the thing that we are sure of is that God has prepared good works for me to practice. Can you tell that to your neighbor, that there's good works for me to practice? That's a sure thing. It's a sure thing. It's there. That, is, that doesn't change. That's the rock. It's true. This is word. But what am I going to do about it? What am I going to do about it? Am I just going to live my life and miss out on that green light? Will I, just do, will, will I just do my life and miss out on that open gate? Because there's a, there's a gate that is open for you, and there's a green light for you to fulfill your calling and your mandate. And it's important, like I said, to personalize it. Like, think about when Jesus was with his disciples. He gets his disciples around, and he says, you want to follow me? I'll make you a fisher of men. Okay. You know what? Jesus was waiting for a response. He had eye contact with them, and, and he said, do you want to follow me? And the disciples had to make a decision. Are we going to follow him or not? You see, one of the problems, like I said, that we have is we generalize the scripture and we don't personalize it. We like to personalize it and we should personalize it when it comes to his love. That we are sons and daughters that we're loved by him. But also, I believe that God uh, comes in in the crowd and looks at us and zooms on us and he says, will you follow me? And then you say, are you talking to me? Yeah, I'm talking to you. I, I remember in grade 10 in math, uh, I did grade nine, I didn't really study and I get in grade 10 and I sit in the back of the class and the guy that sat before me failed the previous year so I was just going to coast in my class, and then the teacher comes in the front, and, and a small lady, but man, wow, I was a little afraid of her later on in the year, and uh, she looks at the, at, the, at the students, and she looks on the list of names, Claude, Claude, where are you? I'm, are you talking to me? Well, I'm the only Claude in the class, right? I, I want you to go in the front, and I want you to, to solve this math problem. I didn't do my homework, right? I didn't have to have time to copy from someone. That's the joke. Uh, <laughs> so I go, I go in the front. I, I, I look like an idiot, right? I didn't know what to do, and I'm standing there, and, and she ha she's having a blast here. And, uh, and, and just to say that the next week or the next class, I was prepared. Uh, if I did not do my homework, well, at least I copied from someone, right? Uh, I was ready to answer the question. Uh, but she... Put me on the spot. The light came on me. And Claude, okay, you're talking to me. I was hiding in the crowd, you see. I never thought she would say my name. When she said my name, it came personal. And I had to respond. And she was looking at me. I remember, I didn't want to go in the front, right? <laughs> Holding the, 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 how do you call it? The, the, not the crayon, but the, the chalk. The chalk and not knowing what to write, right? Not that God wants to do that with you, praise God, right? But the thing is that it becomes personal. Like when Jesus said to his disciples, come and follow me, they had to respond to the call. 
They had to. It was a question that was asked. Are you going to respond to the call? Are you going to say yes? And they had to give an answer, yes or no. And sometimes we don't think, sometimes when we do life and we look at the Bible, we don't see that God is asking the same questions. It's like when he was with his disciples in Matthew chapter 6, and he says, you know, you cannot serve God and mammon. You cannot serve two masters. Okay. And he's looking at his disciples, waiting for a response. Who are you going to serve? Are you going to serve money? Or are you going to serve me? And they're put on the spot. They, they have to answer. Like, we can close the book, right? <laughs> we can walk away, right? But the reality is that Jesus talks the same way to us. Uh, we want it personal. And I want to see Christianity be personal because God wants to be with me and he wants to walk with me. But at the same time, he's got questions you want to ask me. He wants to speak to me. He, he wants to challenge me. And what do I do with that, right? So it has to be more than generalized. I can't hide myself in the crowd. I've got to remember that God has a word for me, and he's asking or he's waiting for a response. Like I said, if Jesus would be here, and he would put the light on you, and he would say, are you going to follow me? What would you say? What would you say? And he's waiting for an answer. He's looking at you, so, so what are you going to do? What would you say? And that's what we have to grasp when it comes to Christianity. Because we have a, like I said, what we do, we generalize it, we don't personalize it. But we have to personalize it because this is how God functions. And that's how it is. And it's, it, it, it's so cool, at the same time it's challenging, right? If you look at Luke chapter 9, verse 57, we see this example. It says, as they were walking along, someone said to Jesus, I will follow you wherever you go. And, but Jesus replied, foxes have dens to live in, birds have nests but the Son of Man has no place even to lay his head. And he said to another person, Come, follow me. And the man agreed, but he said, Lord, first let me turn home and bury my father. And when I, when I was in Israel last week, um, they were talking about burial, like it takes probably a year to bury someone. Like you bury a person, but a year later you come and you collect the bones, and you put, bone, put the bones into a box, or you bring the bones in the place of your forefathers, and they put all the bones together. So it was probably a process of a year before he uh, would be able to follow Jesus. And, and Jesus says, hey, he says, um, he says, and Jesus told them, let the spiritually dead bury their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach about the kingdom of God. So he had a call upon his life. In verse 61, another said, yes, Lord, I will follow you, but first let me say goodbye to my family. And Jesus said, um, told them, Anyone who puts his hand to the plow, then looks back, is not fit for the kingdom of God. What, what Jesus was saying here, what we see here is Jesus was personal. He's, he's in their face. He asks this question, are you going to follow me? And then, uh, don't know what to say, gives an excuse, right? And, 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 and I believe when it comes to us, we can have an excuse and, and not respond to God's call, but we have to realize that God set everything up for us to enter in what he has in store. He has given me the Holy Spirit, dwells in me. He has given me the word. He has given me the church to work with. So he worked everything out for me to enter through that gate and to walk on that green light. But the bottom line, it's my choice. My prayer is that you would say, yes, God, I, I, I want to respond to you on a personal level. I like what C.S. Lewis said. The only thing Christianity cannot be is moderately important. If it's true, if this book is really true, it deserves your entire life. If it's not true, we ought to pack up and go home right now. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. See? And we get caught in the Western world as in between, like, where we hide in the crowd and we don't make it personal. I believe Jesus is asking you today, and he's asking questions to your life. How, how, how are you going to plan your life? Are you gonna, how are you treating your wife? How are you, how are you pursuing, uh, pursue, pursuing uh, my word? Um, he, he's, he's asking us personal questions, and I believe that we're called to respond to that. We're, we're called to respond to that invitation. And God is not called to be a spoke on my will, but he wants to be the hub of my life. 
Like we could have God as a spoke, right? Like everything else, he's part of it. But that's not the definition of a Christian. Christian means a follower of Jesus. Actually, Christian means a little Christ. You're walking behind him. You're following his example. So what you want is to see God be your hub. You want to live for him. But that's a question that it's for me to answer and for you to answer. It's, it's personal. But, but you, you got to see it, though. you you got to realize that God is asking you that question. And you'll have to give an answer to that question. The third thing, the third thing I need to see in my life, I need to make a, I need to, to step up. It's, it's time for me to pursue God. And look at this. God laid the foundation when it comes to his presence. It says in Hebrew chapter 4 verse 16, I can approach the throne of God with assurance. Can you say to your neighbor, with assurance, with boldness? So, there's a green light for me to approach God. There's a green light. The gate is open for me to experience God. So, so what am I going to do? Am I going to enter through that gate? Am, am I going to run this green light? Or am I just going to miss out on what God has for us? You see, God doesn't force himself on us. And if you look at the book of Revelation where he says that he knocks at the, church, the door of the church and he wants to enter in, it's a choice, right? But he's knocking at the door, he opened the gate, the light is green, and I have a choice. What am I going to do? Let's say Jesus would be here and he would ask you, do you want me in your life? What would you say? The light comes on you and says, son, daughter, do you want me in your life? What would you say? I've got to answer that question. I've got to, maybe not here, maybe at home, I've got to answer that question. When, when I was on, uh, when I went to, to Israel, I was talking with this guy. We had a lot of waiting time, especially in the airport. And one guy was asking me, what, how do you define, what would be uh, an important factor, or an important thing in your life when it comes to Christianity? And I have to apologize because I probably told the story before. There's some stories that we go to, and that's a story I go to. So if I've told the story before and you've heard the story before, I apologize. Um, like most of you know, I, I was raised in northern Ontario, and I did a lot of hunting and fishing. And every fall, we would have a week off of school to go hunting. It's, it was cultural. The school was basically empty in the fall when it came to the end of October, early November. And uh, I used to go hunting with my dad, with my brother-in-laws, and, and we, we did a lot of hunting. And one of the things that you look for is moose tracks, right? We're hunting for moose, so we're looking for moose tracks. Uh, and you can look at the tracks, and you can know by the tracks how big the moose is. You can know the gender. You can know also how fresh it is when the moose passed, right? So I was telling this, this man about that when it comes to life, I'm not content with the tracks, I don't want to be an expert about the tracks where I know how big they are, I know how, how big the moose was, the gender and all that when he passed. I don't want to have a master's in tracks. I want to see the moose. You know, when I see the moose, when I see this beast, it changes everything. You know, I might even have buck fever. And buck fever is you don't know how your gun functions anymore. Yeah, it's true. Your glasses get fogged up. You're... you're, you're Palms are wet. Your heart is beating. You have a problem to keep. You practice with your scope, and, and you're pretty good when it comes to the target. But there's the moose, man, and it's your heart to contain. It changes everything. I said so there's two kinds of Christianity. You, you can master the tracks, know all about God, or you can see God and experience God. You can pursue God. You can experience him in your life. So that's what I want. I was defining for me what really matters. I want to see him. And, and let me tell you is that the gate is open. The light is green. The light is green. The gate is open. I, I can come in. I can experience God. I can see him. I can touch him. I can hear his voice. It, it can be real in my life. And that's what Jesus came to do. He came to pave the way so that we can enter in so that I, I, I can walk in freedom from my hurts. I, I can function and, and, and um, step in my calling. And thirdly, I can know him personally like never before, like no one else. I, I like what it says in James chapter 4, verse 8. Come close to God and God would 
will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. See? What, what James is doing here is challenging the church. So where's your loyalty? Is it for God or for the world? Like it's in, he's, in, he's in the face of the church here. He says, hey, so what are you going to decide? Are you going to decide to, have, to be loyal to the world? Or are, we, are you going to be loyal to God? This is it. What are you going to do? And you need to decide. Right? And, 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 I, and I need to decide. Because Christianity is personal. I, I like this text in Joshua chapter 24, verse 14. I invite the worship team to come. It's the example of Joshua that, the example, the example of Joshua gave same kind of thoughts. He's there and he's before the, the Israelites and he says in verse 14 of chapter 24, now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your forefathers worshipped beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. But, ser- but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your forefathers served beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in, in whose land you are living. But for me and my household, we'll serve the Lord. You see? He make a stand. He, he responds to the call, me and my household will serve the Lord. And he throws this very boldly to the Israelites. So what are you going to do? Are you going to serve the God of this land? Are you going to serve the God of your forefathers' worship in Egypt and also in the wilderness? Or are you going to stand with me and say, I choose to serve the God of Israel. But yeah, I, I choose to serve and to follow Yahweh. And, and it was a decision that they had to make because it's personal. And God wants a response. And my prayer is that you would say, God, I, I want to respond to you. And I, I look at the Israelites. God had opened the door. Uh, he, has given, he gave promise, promises regarding the land. He gave them victories over, over their enemies. And he's saying, now it's for you to choose. It's the same thing with me. Same thing with you. There is a green light. And the gate is open. I need to step out where I surrender my past, my sin, my hurts. I'm called to step in my calling to run my race and say, God, I, I want to live for you. I'm called to step up, connect with God and realize that the gate is open and to pursue his presence, to know him personally like never before. That's my call and that's your call. And my prayer is that you would say yes to that. I would ask you to stand. If you've never given your life to Jesus, it's time. It's like Bortemius, Jesus is passing by. You're not here by accident. Jesus is, is here. You don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow or next year or next month, but he's passing by, respond to him. The only way that you can have him in your life if, 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 it's you, if you respond. Maybe you walked away from the Lord and you knew about God, or you learned about you learned about God when you were a kid, but you're not following Him. You got to respond. He's passing by. He's here. We we live in the year of the Lord's favor. But I need to respond. If that's you, this morning, I want you to respond. Can you raise up your hand? If that's you, this morning, right? All right. Mm. Want to lead us, Julie?
Father, we thank you for your love and your affection. And Father, we thank you for the privilege we have to experience freedom and the privilege we have to serve you and the privilege we have to know you personally. And Father, we choose, hmm, we choose to say yes to you. God, we want to respond to you like Bartimaeus, son of David, have mercy on me. I want you to stop in my life. Uh, I want you to stop in my life. I want you to be real in my life. Father, I just pray that as we leave this place that we would embrace you personally. We would respond to the invitation. We would respond to your questions in, in a way that will honor you and give you glory. So Father, I pray for your blessings upon your people that uh, you would continue to work in our lives and, and that you would continue to draw us closer to you. And, and that we would be ambassadors for you as we leave this place, that we would point people to you, 
because you are in us. And all the people of God said, Amen.